So in the previous lecture, we were discussing discrete time Fourier transform, which is um, the Fourier transform for the discrete time signals. So the way the modus operandi for this particular class of Fourier transform is we view a periodic discrete time signal as periodic signal with infinite periodicity. So we, we started with the signal X of N and we started with the signal X of N and then we converted it into a periodic signal X tilde of N, which converts to X of N as capital N goes to infinity. Okay, and then for X tilde of N, the Fourier transform, uh, Fourier series analysis can be done because it's a periodic signal. So we did the Fourier series analysis. And then after going through some very complicated derivation, maybe not complicated, but it's just straightforward derivation. Uh, we converse to two equations. The first is we defined X of E raised to J omega as summation of Xn, which is the original aperiodic signal times e raised to negative j omega n. The summation is over n that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So that was the first equation. And then after doing some more calculation and taking the limit n goes to infinity, uh, we arrived at the following expression, which is x of n is given as an integral of the Fourier transform times e raised to j omega n d omega. And you divide it by one over two pi. Um, uh, because because in one of the expressions above one over n is equal to omega naught by two pi. So that's two pi essentially appeared here in the denominator. So let me write down these expressions clearly once more. So we had x of n equals to one over two pi this integral can be taken and over any two pi, any interval of length two pi, x e raised to j omega, d omega. So this is the synthesis equation. Then we have analysis equation. Okay, so one thing we did not discuss in the previous lecture, so let me go back to the previous lecture. One thing I did not discuss is where did this two pi come from? Why are we integrating only over an interval of two pi and not over the entire real line? Well, the reason is if you go back to this summation, this K is between zero to capital N minus one, right? So I can take this summation one over two pi. This equality, I can take it as one over two pi summation, k goes from zero to n minus one. So the k goes only from zero to n minus one, which means that if you look at omega, uh, or k omega naught, which is what our omega is. So, 
So if you look at k omega naught, this is two pi k over capital N. So if k goes from zero to n minus one, then omega goes from zero to two pi. Okay, and that's the reason when you do the summation k equals zero to n minus one with the limit n goes to infinity or omega naught goes to zero, you arrive at this integral, which with the limit from zero to two pi, or for that matter, any length of interval two pi. Okay, so hopefully you understand all the different components that allows it, allowed us to derive this particular expression. And that's what I'm, we'll be discussing in today's lecture. Any question on this part? Okay, so everyone knows where this two pi comes from. Everyone knows where this two pi comes from. And of course, everyone knows why we have an integral expression here. And that's because we are taking a limit n goes to infinity for a summation. So that's what gets converted into integral in the limit. Okay. So this is what we have. Uh, X of e raised to j omega is known as the Fourier transform and the opposite going from X, capital X to small x, or going from the Fourier transform to the time series is called inverse Fourier transform. This is for the discrete time system. Okay, what we are going to discuss today is that this uh, Fourier transform for discrete time system satisfies many properties that we have already studied in the context of continuous time signals. So there is quite a bit of similarity between discrete time Fourier transform and continuous time Fourier transform. And we'll go over them carefully in the in today's lecture. Okay. Let's begin with an example. So let's look at example number one my x of n is a raised to n u n a is less than one so it's a decaying exponential u of n this is the step in this is the step signal This is n, and this is x of n, and this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Okay, so this is a decaying exponential, and it's not a periodic signal. It's not periodic. We cannot take Fourier series, but we can take Fourier transform of this particular signal. Let's try to compute that. Excuse me. Okay, so I'll do the easy step, which is just to substitute x of n with a raised to n u of n e raised to minus j omega n. 
So I did the easy part. Now I want you to do the difficult part. How do I go about computing this infinite sum? You could start off with the fact that the step function makes everything less than zero equal to zero. So the sum right. now goes from zero to infinity. Perfect. So u of n, remember u of n is equal to one for n greater than zero and zero for n less than zero. So I can replace the summation from n equals to zero to infinity, a raised to n, e raised to minus j omega n. Okay, so someone help me with step one. What about step two? Who wants to help? Who's not afraid of being wrong? Anyone wants to try? Okay, let me give you a hint. So a raised to n, and this is this can be construed at, as e raised to minus j omega raised to n. So I can write it as a e raised to minus j omega raised to n, where absolute value of a is less than one, which implies that absolute value of a e raised to minus j omega what's wrong is also less than one. Okay, what's this infinite sum equal to? What is this infinite sum equal to? So this is equal to summation lambda raised to n, n equals zero to infinity. Anyone remembers the formula for this? This is one over one minus lambda. So I can use this formula to get so this holds only when lambda is less than one, right? So if it holds when lambda is less than one, so in this case, this lambda is less than one. So this is just one over one minus a e raised to minus j omega. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's look at the second example. I need to yes. keep looking at that. Sorry, I didn't get written down fast enough. Okay, sure, sure. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go to the second example. And here I want my x of n to be one for n less than equal to n1 and it's zero for n greater than n1. So what does this signal look like?
this is n1 equals to min uh, n1 equals to 2 okay our goal is to compute the fourier transform of this particular signal So let's start with the formula. Let's start to write x of e raised to j omega, which is summation n equals to minus infinity to plus infinity xn e raised to minus j omega n. Now I know that my x of n is zero outside of the region uh, minus n1 to n1. So I have okay now I have to compute this sum which perhaps looks complicated at the first glance. What should we do? I don't know if it would help any, but could we set our lower bound to zero and then? Yeah, yeah. So how would we set the lower bound to zero? I should take and then, the and down, then... right? What's that? I didn't catch that. Yeah, let me write what it's going to look like. E raised to minus j omega n1. So that's what we have. So if I let e raised to j omega n1 out, then I have 1 plus e raised to minus j omega. right this should be n1 okay so let's look at this particular summation it seems to be of the form 1 plus lambda plus lambda square plus lambda raised to 2n1. So what should we do? What is this summation equal to? Kyle, do you know the answer? No? No one wants to try? So it's equal to this. Uh, hopefully by the end of this class, by the end of this semester, you would be very comfortable with geometric series. It's, it's, it's an absolute necessity in ECE department. Okay, so I get e raised to j omega n1 and then I have one minus e raised to minus j omega two n one plus one over one minus e raised to minus j omega. Now this looks like a horrible expression, but actually after doing a lot of cancellations and stuff, you can get x e raised to j omega to be 
sine omega n1 plus half over sine omega over 2. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is known as a rectangular pulse. Let's talk about Fourier transform for periodic signals. Okay, so Fourier transform initially we defined it for a periodic signal. Now we will extend that definition to periodic signals by employing the tool of delta function. So let's consider, I'm not sure it's not rejecting my palm very well. I don't know what the problem is. Oh, e raised to j omega n. So this is a j omega naught n. This is a periodic signal. Okay, so far we have talked about Fourier transform for aperiodic signals, signals that are not periodic. Now we want to extend that definition to periodic signal. So how should we compute the Fourier transform? We can't really use the original idea, the, the, the solution. So what was the original way of doing it? That was the summation of xn e raised to minus j omega n. So we can't use that. So instead, We will define this to be two pi delta omega minus omega naught. This is for zero less than omega less than two pi or z minus pi. So yeah, there is a reason why I'm, I'm restricting the range of omega and that's because x e raised to j omega repeats itself after every two pi interval, right? Because x e raised to j omega equals to x e raised to j omega by two plus two pi. So because of this equality, uh, you just have to specify x e raised to j omega within an interval of two pi. And after that, it's just going to just repeat itself. So there's no point specifying it outside of the interval two pi. Usually we would like to specify it in the interval minus pi to pi. So that way we know what's low frequency and what's high frequency. Now, if you want to specify x e raised to j omega over the entire real line, then you have to write it as, as a following summation. This is just some mathematical jugglery. It's not important for concepts. So by adding this, 
negative 2 pi L and taking the summation L goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, you have extended this definition of X e raised to J omega for all omega in R. And what I had written here was corresponding to L equals to zero. Okay. Now let's consider this expression and try to compute the inverse Fourier transform for this definition of x e raised to j omega. So I get my x of n is 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to pi. Uh, let me just write 2 pi. So any interval of length 2 pi. Right, this is the inverse Fourier transform. Let's evaluate this. What do I get? I can cancel this one over two pi with two pi. Now I have a delta function getting multiplied to e raised to j omega n. So what would this integral be equal to? That just be e to the j omega naught n? Right. So I'll just replace, because it's a delta function, wherever I have omega, I'll replace it with omega naught. Right. So this is what I get. X of n equals to e raised to j omega naught n. If we're replacing every omega with an omega naught, shouldn't the, uh, the, del the d omega at the end of our integral be omega naught? Uh, so I this is the integral, right? So this is just the, right. yeah. So you don't replace so why is, anything. Well, then why, why are we treating um, our omega as omega naught? Well, okay. Let me re remind you of this integral uh, f of t delta t minus t naught dt. When you take this integral, you get f of t naught. Uh, okay. That's how we had defined the delta function. Thank you. Sure. Now let's, so this, this so everyone understands this. Okay, so we, we basically, we wanted to define the Fourier transform for periodic signal. So we came up with a way to define it which is this particular method, this method uh, using the, by using the delta function. And then we took the inverse Fourier transform and we saw that that particular expression seems correct. Okay, so therefore that's how we will define the Fourier transform. Okay. Now let's consider another Let's consider another uh, x of n, which is a k e raised to j k omega naught n k equals to n. So I can take k going from zero to n minus one or one to n or whatever, like some n consecutive values of k. 
omega not equals to 2 pi over n. So for this situation, the Fourier transform is defined as follows. What do you think? What do you think the Fourier transform would be defined as for this case? Okay, let me just write it. K goes from zero to n minus one. So I'm just picking like n consecutive values of K. So K equals zero to n minus one. You can pick K equals one to n, it doesn't matter. And then the Fourier transform for this part is two pi delta omega minus K omega naught. This is for omega between zero to two pi. Now, if you want to define for omega over the entire real line, then x e raised to j omega for this case is Two pi a k. This is for omega in R. So that defines the Fourier transform for all values of omega, just taking the sum minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is the conceptual step. I want everyone to understand this. This part is just the mathematical extension so that we can define this function over the entire real, real line, not just uh, between zero to two pi. But of course we understand that this function, the second one is just a repetition of X e raised to J omega over the entire real line. So you're not saying those are equivalent, you're just changing the, the bounds pretty That's much. Right. That's right. That's right. That's okay. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so we have identified a way to extend the concept of Fourier transform to, period, uh, to periodic functions, yes. Okay, so every periodic function can be written in the form of Fourier series, right? And for each term of the Fourier series, we know exactly what the Fourier transform is going to look like. So therefore the definition just follows immediately by the linearity of the Fourier transform. And we have this result. Okay, so looks like everything is clear so far, no questions. So let's proceed with the next topic, which is properties of Fourier transform. And of course we are looking at properties of discrete time Fourier transform, but many of these properties are very similar to the continuous time Fourier transform. So we are going to look at the following properties. Uh, one is periodicity, which I have already alluded to before. So x e raised to j omega plus 2 pi is equal to x e raised to j omega. So x e raised to j omega as a function of omega is a periodic function. It repeats itself after every 2 pi.
the second property, which is the famous linearity property. So X1 of N, the Fourier transform is X1. What do you think the Fourier transform is going to look like for a linear combination of x1 and x2? Should it be a times um, capital X1 e, yeah. e to the j omega, and the same would be only for capital X2? Right. Great. So wait, why are, is it b or, or is it just a2 oh, or does it but, matter? But no, it's b, it's b. Okay, let's talk about time shifting next. So I have Xn whose Fourier transform is X e raised to J omega. Now I want to shift the time. I have a delay in my system because of physical reasons, which introduced a delay in the signal. Now the question is, what would the, how would the Fourier transform change? Okay, so it turns out that it will be J omega N naught X e raised to J omega. And let's try to see why. What can I do? I have an infinite sum and I have n minus n naught in the argument for x. Any idea how I can deal with this situation? Just substitute n naught for all n's. Uh, right, so let's, let's try to do it the methodical way. So, so that is, that is absolutely correct, but let me do it in a similar fashion, but by being more explicit. So I replace n minus n naught by n prime. So then n becomes n prime plus n naught. And so I have n prime goes from minus infinity to plus infinity x of n prime e raised to minus j omega n prime plus n naught. So now there is no room for confusion.
And now I can take e raised to minus j omega n naught outside because that doesn't depend on n prime. That is exactly equal to So I did a change of variables in this step. And then after that, it was purely a matter of taking common terms outside and doing all the summation as suggested by one of your friends. Okay, this is not complicated, but some work was needed to do it. Let's look at a similar uh, frequency shifting so if i take e raised to j omega n not no j omega not n x n so i shifted the frequency of the signal x n then this changes to e raised to j Sorry, j omega minus omega naught. So by multiplying by e raised to j omega naught n, you actually shift the frequency of the Fourier series, uh, sorry, Fourier transform itself. the proof, I leave it as an exercise. It will follow the same uh, change of variable idea that we did in the previous uh, page. Okay, let's talk about conjugation and conjugate symmetry. This is the fourth property. So I have a signal whose Fourier transform is capital X. I want to take the complex conjugate of that signal. And it turns out that the Fourier transform will be also conjugated, but with e raised to minus j omega in the argument. So there are two changes here. The first change is the function x itself gets conjugated and the argument of this x star conjugate of x is e raised to minus j omega. Now we know that if xn is real, it's a real signal. And you know, um, since I'm a controls guy, I only deal with real signals. I, I don't deal with complex signals. A lot of signal processing people do deal with complex signals, but I don't, unfortunately. So this applies to me. If Xn is real, then Xn equals 
so sorry the conjugate of xn is equal to x of n which implies that x e raised to j omega is equal to x star e raised to minus j omega Any question? Are any of you interested in the proof for this result? I can take it or leave it. Okay. Anyone who has a strong inclination to what to to see the proof of this particular result? No one. Okay, let's move on to the next property. The fifth property is the difference and accumulation. So in the context of continuous time signal, the difference was replaced with differentiation and the accumulation was replaced with integration. That's what we studied in the continuous time case. So there is a slight difference now because in the discrete time, you can't really take the differentiation because the time, time axis is not continuous, it's discrete variables. So here you talk about difference equation instead of differentiation, and you talk about accumulation instead of integration. So let's set up the problem. I have an Xn whose Fourier transform is X e raised to J omega. So this is a difference equation. And by the time shift property and by the linearity, Anyone knows what this Fourier transform is going to look like? So remember that there is a time shift property. So let's let's look at the time. So this, due to linearity, the first one is just e raised to j omega. What about the second one? What's the Fourier transform of x n minus one? Isn't it? Um to the negative z, or negative one, uh, I'm thinking of z transformations, uh, to the negative one power. Right, e raised to minus j omega, that's right. We'll get to z transform towards the end of this uh, class. So in April last week, probably. <laughs> in 2050, they were like the first thing we covered. <laughs> You're way ahead of the schedule. Okay, so this is e raised to minus j omega. One minus okay, so that's the difference equation, and that's the Fourier transform for the difference equation. Now comes the more complicated one, which is integration or rather the accumulation. So the accumulator looks something like this. I'm taking all the values of x until time n and I'm going to add it up. That's my accumulator. That's my that that's like an integration in discrete time. Okay, so in this case, the Fourier transform is uh, somewhat complicated. 
it's x e raised to j omega over one minus e raised to minus j omega plus pi x e raised to j zero I have to write it in a compact fashion. So the Fourier transform for accumulation, accumulator is uh, somewhat complicated. And of course this holds for all omega in R. If you're interested in the values for omega between minus pi to pi, you can rewrite this as By the way, x e raised to j zero is just one. I mean, it's equal to x of one. And this is delta omega. This is for omega between minus pi to pi. Okay, if you recall that the integration in continuous time, we also had a similar term in the continuous time case as well. Okay, so let me go back to some lecture. I don't know whether it was 15, 16, 17 integration. Yeah, there it is. So I want to draw your attention to this particular result, pi of x zero delta omega. All of you see this, this is the, this is the Fourier transform for integration, right? And we have exactly a similar expression in the case of discrete time signal. Okay, pi e, x e raised to j zero, right? So omega is replaced with zero and I have delta omega. So in some sense, this resembles very much like the integration, the, the Fourier transform for uh, integration in continuous time. Let's talk about time reversal. So the Fourier transform for Xn is I reverse the time and my Fourier transform will change to x e raised to minus j omega. So the functional form for x would remain the same. It's just that e raised to j omega will get, uh, will, will be replaced with e raised to negative j omega. Okay, so I, my time is up. I'll go over some other uh, Parseval's relation and differentiation and frequency domain and all that stuff.
some other properties of Fourier transform, including the, um, uh, what was that, convolution. Uh, convolution property of Fourier transform. We'll go over all of that in the next class. Uh, oh, the next class is not this Friday. This Friday, you have your quiz too. And the next class will be on Monday next week. So um, I'll be available for office hours. If you have any questions to prepare for the quiz, uh, definitely let me know and I can answer them in my office hours. Or if you can't make it to the office hours on Friday, just let me know and we can figure out a time to meet. So thank you and uh, I'll see you guys on Monday next week or in my office hours. Thanks, Arjun.